Hi, in this module, I'm going to talk about neural networks, a way to construct nonlinear predictors via problem decomposition. So when we started, we talked about linear predictors. And they were two, linear in two ways. First is that the feature vector was linear, function of x. And the way that the feature vector interacted with the prediction was also linear. This gave you rise to lines. Next, we talked about nonlinear predictors, but keeping the same linear machinery, but just playing around with the feature vector. And by adding terms like x squared, you could get quadratic predictors and so on. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define neural networks where we can just leave e of x alone, the feature vector alone, and play with the way that the feature vector uh, results in the prediction. And that will allow us to get all sorts of fancy stuff. So let me begin with a motivating example. So suppose you're trying to predict whether two cars are going to collide or not. So the input are the positions of the two cars. So x1 is the position of car 1, and x2 is the position of car 2. And what you'd like to output is whether y equals 1, whether there's, it's safe, or y equals 1, whether y equals minus 1, or whether they collide or not. And what is unknown here um, is that we're going to say that cars are safe if they're sufficiently far. So if the distance between them is at least one, then we're going to be safe. So we can visualize this a true um, predictor as follows. So here is x1 and x2. And um, what is going to happen is we're going to draw these two lines here. And anything, any point that is over here and anything that is over here is going to be labeled as uh, plus, which is safe. And anything that's in between is going to be labeled as minus, or that they'll collide. Okay, so let's do, do some examples here. So suppose we have a point 0, 2, which is this point here. Um, this is safe. So y goes 1, 2, 0 is also safe, and 0, 0 is uh, here, which is not safe, and uh, 2, 2 is minus 1, which is also not safe. Okay, so as an aside, this configuration point is what was historically known as the XOR problem, and it was shown that your linear classifiers could not be used to solve this problem. You couldn't draw a line to separate the blue and the orange points. But nonetheless, we're going to show how neural networks can be used to uh, solve this. OK, so the key intuition is the idea of problem decomposition. So instead of solving the problem all at once, we're going to decompose it into two subproblems. So first, we're going to test if car 1 is to the far right of car 2. And in the picture here, that corresponds to simply this region over here, which we're going to call h1. So h1 is whether x1 minus x2 is greater than or equal to 1. And then we're going to find a sub another subproblem, testing whether car2 is to the far right of car1, which is called h2. That corresponds to this uh, region over here. And then we're going to predict safe if at least one of them is true. So we just add the two here, which is either one or zero. And if at least one of them is one, then we're going to return plus one. And by convention, we're going to assume that the sign of zero is uh, minus one. OK, so um, here are some examples here. So suppose we have zero, two again. So this point. H1 says, nope, that's not on my side. H2 says, yep, that's on my side. And at least one is enough to make the prediction plus one. If you take two zero, that's this point. Um, H1 says, yep. H2 says, nope. And then F is one, because all it takes is one. Zero, zero is this point. Both of them say no, and it's minus one. And same with two, two. Both of them say no, it's minus. OK, so so far, we've just defined the true function f. Um, uh, of course, we don't know f. So 
what we're going to do is try to move gradually to defining a hypothesis class. And the first next step is to rewrite f using vector notation. So here are the two intermediate subproblems, and the predictor is f of x equals a sign. And what we're going to do is to write this in terms of uh, a dot product between a weight vector and a uh, feature vector. So here's a feature vector, 1, x1, x2. And then we're going to define a weight vector, which is minus 1. And if you look at the dot product, it's going to be so it's minus 1 plus x1 minus x2. And if that quantity is greater than 0, then we're going to return 1. Otherwise, return 0. And you can verify that this is exactly just a rewrite of this expression. And similarly, if you reverse the roles of x1 and x2, then you can rewrite x h2 as uh, in vector notation as well. And now what we're going to do is we're going to just combine h1 and h2 by stacking them. So we're going to define this matrix, which is just the two weight vectors here stacked up. So we have two rows here. And we're going to multiply this matrix by the feature vector. So remember, left multiplication by uh, a matrix is just taking the dot product with each of the rows of that matrix. And now this produces a two-dimensional vector. And we're going to test whether each component is greater or equal to 0. So in the end, h of x is going to be a two-dimensional vector. Okay. And now, given that, we can rewrite the predictor as simply the sign of the dot product between 1, 1 and h of x, which is simply the sum of the two components. So now we've re written f of x, which is a true function, in terms of uh, a bunch of matrix or vector multiplies. Now, everything in red here are just numbers. And so far, we've specified what they are. But in general, we're not going to know them, and we're going to have to learn them from data. But before we do that, we're going to preemptively see one problem that's going to come up. And this problem we saw before when we tried to optimize the 0 and 1 loss. So let's look at the gradient of h1 of x with respect to v1. Um, we can plot this as follows. So here is um, the, well, the score z, um, which is the dot product. And um, this is h1. And this is just a step function. So the step function or threshold function is just whether z is greater than 0. It's 1 over here and 0 over here. OK, so now if you try to do gradient descent on this, uh, you're just going to get stuck because the gradients are going to be 0 basically everywhere. So the solution is to replace this threshold function with a more general activation function, sigma, which has more friendly gradients. So classically, and by classic, I mean like in the 80s and 90s, people use the logistic function uh, as activation function, which looks like this. And this is just a kind of a smooth out version of the threshold function. And in particular, its gradients are 0, uh, nowhere. So that's just great. So the gradient, you can always move make progress. There is a caveat here, which is that if you look out here, this, this function is pretty flat, which means that the gradient is actually approaching 0, which means that if you're out here, then you can get stuck or at least make very slow progress. So in 2012, the ReLU activation was you know, invented, which just takes a max of x, a z, and 0. So that looks like this. So if the input to the ReLU is less than a 0, then I'm just going to keep it, clip it to 0. And then otherwise, I'm going to just leave it alone. So now this function actually has um, nice gradients over here. So the gradient never vanishes. It's always you know, positive and bounded away from 0. Um, although over here, it is 0. So it turns out empirically, the ReLU uh, activation function works really well. It's simpler in a lot of ways. So it's kind of become the activation function of choice here. 
So um, the solution here is to replace this threshold step function with an activation function. Choose your favorite. I would choose the ReLU. And now you have uh, something that has uh, non-vanishing gradients. So let's now define two layer neural networks using the machinery that we've set so far. Okay, so we're gonna set, define some intermediate set problems. Um, so we start with a feature vector B of X. Now I'm gonna represent vectors and matrices using these dots. Um, so this is a six dimensional uh, feature vector, but in general, it's D-dimensional. Um, I'm going to next multiply it by this weight matrix which is going to be a, a three by six, but in general, a K by D matrix. And now that generates a three dimensional or K dimensional vector. I'm gonna send it through this nonlinearity uh, activation function like the ReLU or the logistic. And we're gonna get a vector, which I'm gonna call H of X. Okay, so now given this H of X, I can now do prediction by taking H of X and simply dot producting it with uh, a weight vector W. And if I take the sign, and that gives me the prediction of that neural network. So one thing that's kind of interesting here is that if you look at this equation, it really pretty much looks like the equation for a linear classifier. The only difference is now we have H of X instead of P of X. So one way to interpret what neural networks are doing is that instead of using the original feature vector, we've kind of learned a smarter representation. And at the end of the day, we're still doing a linear classification on top of that feature representation. So you can often people think about neural networks as doing feature learning for precisely this reason. And finally, now we can define the hypothesis class F is equal to set of all predictors um, and the predictor is given parameterized by a weight matrix V and a weight vector W um, defined up here. And we can let the weight matrix be any arbitrary K by D uh, matrix. And we let W be any D dimensional uh, vector. Sorry, this D should actually be a K there. I will fix that. Okay, so we have defined a hypothesis class that corresponds to two layer neural networks for classification. Now we can kind of push this farther. We can go and talk about deep neural networks. So remember going back to single layer neural networks, AKA linear predictors, we see that we take the feature vector, we take the dot product with respect to a weight vector and you get the score, which can be used to drive prediction directly in the regression or take the sign to get classification predictions. Um, for two layer neural networks, we take phi of x, we take the dot product between layer one's uh, weight matrix, take element-wise uh, activation function, and then multiply dot product with a weight vector, you get the score. And now the key thing is that this piece, v, apply v and then apply sigma, you can just iterate over and over again. So here's a three layer neural network, take phi of x, which is a feature vector, you multiply by some matrix V1, take a nonlinearity, I'll multiply by another matrix, take a nonlinearity, and then finally you get some uh, vector that you take the dot product um, with W and you get the score, which can be used to power your predictions. So one small note is that I've left out all the bias terms uh, for notational simplicity. In practice, you would have uh, you know, bias terms. Okay, and you can imagine just iterating this um, you know, over and over again. But you know, wh what is this doing? It it's kind of looks like a little bit of abstract nonsense. You're just multiplying by matrices and sending them through nonlinearity and you hope something good happens. And you know, that's not, com there's not uh, completely false, but there are some intuitions which we can derive. So one intuition is thinking about layers as representing multiple levels of abstraction. So in computer vision, let's say the input is uh, an image. So you can think about the first layer as computing 
some sort of notion of edges. And the second layer, when you multiply matrix and you take a nonlinearity, you compute some notion of uh, object parts. And then the third layer, you um, uh, multiply by matrix and apply some nonlinearity, you get uh, some notion of objects. Now, this is kind of a, just a story, and we haven't talked at all about learning. So this is definitely not true for all neural networks. It turns out that when you actually learn a network to data and you visualize what the weights are, you actually do get some interpretable results, which is kind of interesting and you know, somewhat surprising. So now there's a question of uh, depth. So the fact that you take a feature vector and you apply um, some sort of transformation again and again and again to get a score. So why, why do we do this? So one intuition that we talked about already is this is representing different levels of abstraction to kind of low level uh, pixels to high level object parts and objects. Um, another way to think about this is this is performing multiple steps of computation. Just like in a classic program, if you get more steps of computation, it gives you more expressive power, you can do more things. You can think about each of these operations as simply doing some compute. Now, it's, it's maybe a kind of a foreign type of compute because you're multiplying by a crazy unknown matrix. But what way we can think about this is that you set up this compute computation and learning algorithm is going to figure out what kind of computation makes sense for making the best prediction. Um, another piece of intuition is that empirically, it just happens to work really well, um, which is not, not to be understated. Um, if you're looking for a more uh, theoretical reason, um, there, the jury is kind of still out on this. You can have uh, uh, intuitions how um, you know, deeper logical circuits can capture more than shallower ones, but then there's like the kind of relationship between circuits and neural networks, which is uh, requires a little bit of massaging. So this is still kind of a pretty active area of research. So to summarize, we start out with the very toy problem, the XOR problem, testing whether two cars are gonna collide or not. And we use it to motivate problem decomposition and eventually defining uh, neural networks. Um, we saw that intuitively, neural networks allow you to define nonlinear predictors, but in this particular way, it, in, and the way is to decompose the original problem into intermediate subproblems, testing if the car is to the far right or the far left, and then combining them you know, over time. And you can kind of take this idea further and iterate on this decomposition multiple times, giving rise to multiple levels of abstraction, multiple steps of computation. The hypothesis class is now larger. It contains all predictors where the weights of all the layers can vary um, freely. And then next up, we're going to show you how to actually learn the weights of a neural network. That is the end.